Welcome, guys. Um, it's time for our second verbatim exercise. So again, let me share the screen. I hope you enjoyed the first one that we did. Um, as you can see, it's it's a really good learning tool. And um, and like I said, I'm, I'm more than happy for you to send me any uh, pastoral conversations that you've had, meaningful conversations that you can recall and write up. I'm, I'm more than happy to have a look at them and and share them with others in, in a video just like this so that we can continue to learn together. Um, I'm also always welcoming your feedback. I know that the people who watch my videos, there's a lot of experience out there, a lot of knowledge. Please give me some comments. Give me some, um, some of your feedback. Um, tell me what sort of videos you'd like. But for now, let's stay on track and let's have a look at this pastoral conversation. Um, again, I'm going to read through the conversation just so we get a feel and a gist of it, and then we will have a closer look at it. Here we go. Hey, Andrew, I've got something on my mind that I need to chat with you about. It's my sister-in-law's messy divorce and how it's affecting her kids. Hey, Carol, sure, I'm all ears. What's going on? Well, her divorce is turning into a real dog fight, and the poor kids are caught right in the middle of it. That doesn't sound good. How's it impacting the kids? Well, they're all over the place, acting out and not sleeping well, just all round anxious. It's heartbreaking to watch. That's rough. How's your sister-in-law handling it? She's hanging in there, but it's a roller coaster. The legal battles, the emotional toll, and she's constantly worrying about the kids and she's burning out. Have you guys been able to offer any help or support? We're trying our best. We've been spending time with the kids when we can. We've also suggested that the kids and her see a therapist to help deal with the stress. Well, that sounds like a good idea. It's important for the kids to have someone to talk to during this mess. How about your sister-in-law and her Steve? How are they handling the stress? It's complicated because they're not exactly on speaking terms. Wow, I can see that that would add a lot to the stress, but at least you're doing your best to keep things stable and support the kids through this. Absolutely, Andy. I love their kids as my own. Thanks so much. It was nice to talk to you. I feel better. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. So again, this is obviously um, a couple who are family. And there's obviously a messy divorce going on. So obviously, I, I do change the names of people. Um, and so Andrew is, is uh, the person that's really filling in as the chaplain role. Um, and Carol is obviously his family member. So let's have a look at this conversation a bit closer. Okay, so Carol starts off. Hey, Andrew, I've got something on my mind that I need to chat with you about. It's my sister-in-law's messy divorce and how it's affecting her kids. Right, so we're straight into this. And again, as I mentioned in the last verbatim exercise, when we're talking with someone we know well, we can often skip to the pastoral conversation very quickly and just completely bypass the social conversation. And I just want to say right at the outset, to practice the skills of the pastoral conversation, it can be really tricky when it's with family. It's somehow easier when it's with a stranger and I'm detached from that emotionally. But I know if it's, if it's for example, if it's my wife or it's my kids, I, I much easier slip into problem solving mode. Whereas I don't do that at work. When I'm listening to a patient, in my role as a chaplain, it's very easy to stay detached from needing to solve this. So I just want to say that in fairness to Andrew. You know, when a family member comes to you and they're expecting you to have some words of wisdom and to solve this problem because they've come to you in the past, it can be very challenging to start practicing the elements of the pastoral conversation where we're containing our questions and our advice and our solutions, our fixes and our platitudes. It's really hard because people come expecting solutions or advice and, and it's, an easy, it's an easy pattern to default to when we're with our family, okay? So just that in fairness with Andrew. 
Andrew responds, hey, Carol, sure, I'm all ears. What's going on? So, again, no problems with that. Um, again, I personally, I, I would stay silent because she, I know that she wants to talk to me, so there's no need for me to ask a question or to try and drag something out of her. But that's fine. I mean, I'm, I don't want to be too picky. Carol then lets us know this is what the issue is, the divorce, okay, with her sister-in-law. It's turning into a real dogfight, and the poor kids are caught right in the middle of it. So not an uncommon problem, sadly, in, in the modern world. So how does Andrew respond to that? That doesn't sound good. How is it impacting the kids? So right here, Andrew, and we'll forgive him, like I said, because he's dealing with family, Andrew is in a sense, showing he's uncomfortable. She has made it already very clear in just two statements of hers, in Carol 1 and Carol 2, she's told me how the kids are going. The kids aren't going well. And who can blame them? Every child wants to be a part of a loving, functioning, stable family. And when your mum and dad, when you're these people who represent God, um, you love them both so much. When they're not getting on, that stress, that anxiety, that that pain, that heartache, it just filters down to the kids so quickly and so easily. So Andrew didn't really need to, to ask how is it impacting the kids. He already knows that it's impacting poorly because he's a smart guy and he would know that. And yet he asks that question. So he's he's showing that he's uncomfortable. You know, he's trying to think on, on the run. You know, what can I say? What can I do in this difficult situation? So, but again, you'll notice as always with questions, people answer you, you see? And this is why I don't ask questions in a pastoral conversation. Carol answers. She says, well, they're all over the place. They're acting out and not sleeping well, just all around anxious. It's heartbreaking to watch. None of us didn't know that answer was coming. Of course, that was the likely answer to the question of how's it impacting the kids, okay? Now, Carol's just answered the question, and instead of responding to that, he says, that's rough. How's your sister-in-law handling it? Again, um, Andrew's uncomfortable. How's your sister-in-law handling it? Um, let's guess. Paulie. This is heartbreaking. You go into a marriage thinking this is forever. Yes, there'll be up and downs. This will be in some ways a roller coaster. There'll be tough times, but we love each other and we're going to come through this. But when it reaches the point that we're talking about divorce, it, your heart's breaking. It's the end of dreams. It's it's the, the breakup of the family. Of course. How's she going? Badly. Yeah. She's heartbroken. Depressed disappointed so many different thoughts and feelings she'd be having but again notice carol answers the question she's hanging in there but it's a roller coaster the legal battles the emotional toll and she's constantly worrying about the kids so here it is again the worry about the kids of course any mum or dad even when you're going through a divorce which you'd never want to go through you're going to be worrying about the blowback on the kids okay and she's burning out. So this has just been an exhausting process for her, physically, mentally, emotionally, all of it. So how does Andrew respond? Have you guys been able to offer any help or support? Again, it's an unnecessary question. See, Andrew should be responding to really how Carol's going in this. Instead of asking about the sister-in-law, who's not even there in the room, and who we know the answer to, I would want to be dealing with how is Carol, how is the divorce, how is all of this anxiety, how is it impacting on her? Because she's the person sitting right in front of me at this time, okay? Again, do you notice? You just notice it each time. When you ask someone a question, they tend to answer you, okay? So in that way, you lead the conversation. When someone invites me into their world, I'm not the leader. I'm not the driver of the conversation. I'm the companion. Carol says, naturally, we're trying our best. We've been spending time with the kids when we can. We've also suggested that the kids and her see a therapist to help deal with the stress. 
So again, do you notice that even Carol, she falls into the trap of offering someone advice and solutions, okay? So I can imagine that Carol's sister-in-law has spoken to her about the divorce and how it's impacting on her. And she has recommended they go and see a therapist. I mean, honestly, do we think the sister-in-law hasn't thought of that as an option? Do you notice that in the vast majority of cases, when you offer someone advice, it's advice they already know, you know, but we've got such a strong desire to try and fix, to try and help, that we offer stuff that's not helpful at all because the sister-in-law knows that there are people called family therapists or psychologists uh, who specialize in, in these sort of terrible family crises. That she would know that. But people can't help themselves. And this is why the pastoral conversation is such a beautiful way to engage with someone because you're not doing that. You're containing all of that stuff and you're simply listening, really listening and trying to convey to that person, I understand or I'm really trying to understand the impact of this on you. It's a beautiful, pure way of engaging. And it's not something that most people have experienced and they're really going to love it when you can do it well with them. Because this type of conversation, this is the typical conversation people have. You know, they share their heart with someone and they get back a lot of advice, useless advice, suggestions, fixes, platitudes, shared experiences, questions. What they don't get is the understanding. They don't get that. And that's what they're looking for. Okay. So Andrew says, that sounds like a good idea. It's important for the kids to have someone to talk to during this mess. How about your sister-in-law and Steve? How are they handling the stress? I'd say in the best way they could. Again, you're asking Carol how two other people are going. I, I wouldn't be going down that route. Carol would only be guessing anyway. And I can guess. I can guess without Carol telling me some of the ways they're probably handling this stress. And it's, some of it's going to be, you know, not good for them, like probably drinking too much, stuff like that. So, you know, um, Andrew's comment here at Andrew 5, none of that is really useful at all, okay? Carol says, it's complicated because they're not exactly on speaking terms. Of course. And you see, again, she answers the question. So it's complicated, yeah. It always is. Andrew says, well, I can see how that would add to the stress. Of course, when two people aren't talking, it's just going to add to the overall terrible situation. But at least you're doing your best to keep things stable and support kids through this. You know, it reminds me of something Brene Brown said. She said, any sort of sentence you start with at least don't finish it. Just stop. It's not going to be helpful. It reminds me of, of again, when people have said to someone in the hospital, like uh, recently I was with uh, someone who was 92 and um, she had passed away in the hospital. And a family member said to one of her children, well, at least she had a good innings. As if that is in any way helpful. So, again, um you know, Andrew Six is not really responding to how Carol's feeling and, and understanding what it's what it's like for her. But Carol says, absolutely, of course, I love their kids as my own. Thanks so much. It was nice to talk to you. I feel better. Um, I'm not saying that's untrue because people don't know what they don't know. They don't know how good it can be. And they're used to these sort of responses. This is what they're used to. And so their feel better is, is like just above rock bottom, but they don't know that it can be better. But it can be with the pastoral conversation because when you walk away from a conversation where you go, wow, I felt heard and understood and respected. They didn't give me any cheap advice or solutions that I could just come up with myself. No, they didn't. They really listened. And I felt like someone gets me. That has such a powerful effect, guys. I, I you know, I, I really hope you get an opportunity to experience someone just listening and understanding. So now let's go to some of my 
no more questions. How do you think Carol felt at the end of this conversation? Okay. What did Andrew do well? And what do you think he needs to work on? What other responses could you come up with? So try imagining you were speaking to Carol. And when she makes a response to your comment to you, how would you respond to convey empathy? Okay. So that is, you're putting yourself in Carol's position. A couple that you really love are going through a terrible separation. You love them. You're concerned for them. But you're really also concerned for the kids. They're sort of like, in a sense, the innocent victims in this. So you've got all this love and concern and anxiety about dear family. How would you feel? What comes up for you? And think about putting that into a sentence to respond to Carol. So one of the easy ways I like to do this is to say, what, what were Carol's losses? As you, as you read through the verbatim, what do you think her losses were? And what do you think her feelings were? What do you think, what feelings do you think Carol was expressing? So you come up with some losses, you come up with some feelings, and see if you can combine some of that into a short response back to, to Carol. And when you come up with some ideas, some thoughts, please email me. You see my, my email there? Um, email me and, and I promise I'll respond. All right, guys. So that's another verbatim exercise. There will be more. I'll also be bringing you some verbatims which have some better responses. So we start to see, okay, well, I, I, I obviously know how to, to do it, shall we say, poorly. What would be some good responses? Give me some examples of that. So I'll make sure that the next verbatim that I do for you, I'll do one that I got from one of my volunteers, but shows how they've incorporated the training that I've given them in the fact that they've been able to contain a lot of that other stuff that's a part of the social conversation. And I and I think you'll see a couple of things. One, um, the effect that has on the person you're speaking with. And secondly, that it's possible to learn and to incorporate the elements of the pastoral conversation into a conversation with someone that it's doable. Sometimes I hear from people, they say, I just don't know if I could ever contain the questioning, or I just don't know if I'm ever going to have a degree of comfort with the silences. But persistence pays. And it's only when we quit that we fail, you know? So I always consider... In life, you can either win or you can learn something. So even with a verbatim like this, and let me tell you something else. I have verbatims from Andrew after this one that are so much better, so much better. Um, I might bring you one of Andrew's too in the near future, just so you can see the quick difference he's made in improving as far as limiting his questions, his advices, all of that stuff. OK, I'm really proud of what he's what he's been able to do. So, guys, thank you again. Let me stop sharing the screen. Thank you for joining me. I'm sure you're getting something out of these verbatim exercises. Please comment and let me know. And again, if, if you're finding that there's something here of value, and I know there is, but if you're finding that, share these videos with your, your friends and the people you love. OK, until next time, God bless and uh, see you soon.